I'm Gianna Campa. I'm a junior at Columbia University studying psychology and also a co-founder of BlackLearning.net. Um, hello, I'm Jessica Bisola Omokiki, also known as Sola. I am a junior in NYU's music business program with a minor in performance studies and I'm also an independent artist. And I'm Piper Page. I go by the name, artist name, Piper Page. I'm also a junior in the NYU Music Business Program, double minor in fashion business and pre-law. <laughs> so what is it like to navigate the music industry as black women, especially with the fact that most of the producers and workers in the music industry are white men? It's hard. It's hard. <laughs> it is difficult. <laughs> Um, to say the least. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't know where to start when I was starting actually doing music in New York um, because I knew I wanted to work primarily with women. I knew that I would feel more comfortable with um, producers that understood like proper R&B, R&B pop music. And um, I, feel, I feel like most of the time that's like black producers. Um, mm -hmm. But I didn't know where to start with that. I didn't know where to find them. I didn't know um, really how to use my network yet. I mean, even still now, I primarily work with white producers and it's fine. Like they, they understand the vision, but um, I've been able to go from not knowing at all how to navigate it to I have now a female team. So like seven women behind me that do know how to navigate the music industry <laughs> um, and kind of help me through that. One of who is black. Um, so I'm still figuring it out. You're probably still figuring, it, still out. figuring it out. Yeah, For it's sure. hard um, to also figure out your sound where you place. I think that was one of the things that caught me off guard my freshman year is like I had sent my music to um, an artist manager and I asked him to listen to it and he did and he responded. But his answer was, what's your sound? It's great, but who are you? What are you going to sound like? And so for a year and a half, I struggled with that. Didn't I didn't know the answer to that <laughs> up until recently when I released Risk. So um, yes. I didn't want to sound like every other R&B pop artist out there. I didn't want to sound like, you know, every other LMA or Mahalia or, you know, whatever have you. I wanted it to still be me, sound like me, and there's yeah, and there's just so many boxes that people try to put you in as a black female musician. Mm -hmm. You have to be one or the other, and like <clears throat> genre blending wasn't meant for us. I mean, I grew up with them. Um, I played classical piano, then I switched to jazz, then mm -hmm. I did musical theater for like six years, Classic. and then I finally decided, okay, I love pop music. I want to write pop music, but like you look at the women in the pop sphere and it's it's mostly white women mm -hmm. and then you look at the r&b women and, and that's like all black women dominating the music industry and they're killing it but i wasn't you know i'm not a hip-hop artist i can't rap <laughs> i can't rap so that wasn't my industry but i love all of these sounds all these sounds i grew up with everything that i listened to i want to combine what I love. I want to do what I love. I don't want to be put in a box. So yeah, that's why I say that I try to genre blend as much as I can, including sounds that you wouldn't typically hear. Um, I think with Risk, the, the horns were not expected. And I love horns in music. And they need to be brought back. <laughs> but combining those jazz elements, musical theater and the way that I write music, and then pop and R&B, which I love. So. Yeah, genre blending, mixing, matching, that wasn't really made for black women, truthfully. All black people struggle with it. It's what yeah. they think we're supposed to sound like. Yep. And it's what they think that whole category is supposed to yeah. be. You're black? Okay, we're gonna put you in R&B hip hop. Yeah. Like, first of all, first of all, it's not even what the song was about. <laughs> okay, he even said, just give me the pop award, man. Like, uh, it was a yeah. pop album, it was a pop song. Yeah. Which is just, yeah, no, no, that's yeah. just how it is. Too many boxes. There's so, there's so much work that needs to be done. There's too many boxes, and we don't always have to fit in one. So, yeah, yeah navigating it is finding your sound and owning your sound, mm -hmm. I think. Her, period. Yeah. <laughs> Correct. From the in industry side, like as a musician, we both struggle with like the same things. From like the industry side, like interning in different um, companies in the music industry as a black woman, 
almost impossible to really um, to really you really the imposter syndrome starts to sneak yeah. in because you're like did i get this job because they need to fill a quota or it was i actually qualified and they wanted me i've thought about that with every place i've applied to and everywhere i've been accepted like to even like nyu yeah <laughs> like mm, did i don't know did they need so quota? Cute, like <laughs> but yeah, it's like, like, thank you. No. <laughs> it's just, it's that type of thing where like they're making all these initiatives to go forth more with more diversity, equity, inclusion, and you're like, and they look to you and they're, they want you to be coming forth with these ideas and like you wonder, is that because I'm a black woman and I'm your intern or will I, would a white intern be doing this? It's right. It's just... And I, I like doing the work. Personally, I really do like coming up with different initiatives for diversity and equity and like the company I intern for now. And I, I feel like I'm actually doing a lot of work for them, which is awesome. But in another sense, it's like, did I get this position because of that? You know, there's always going to be that thought. So it's almost impossible to know because, of course, you're going to ask and they're like, no, you were so qualified, which I am. Which I am. <laughs> and, yeah, so, I can't doubt you know, like, <laughs> But um, you never know. And it's just kind of getting past that hill and just working and doing what you need to do and just thriving in what you do and just trusting that you are in the position that you're meant to be in and changing the mold because if you don't, it's just this is just going to repeat forever, yeah. which is where we're at. <laughs> yeah. Which is horrible. But yeah, in all, it's very difficult to navigate as a black woman. We're still figuring it out. We're young. Um, we're going to learn so much more. But we have learned a lot. Yeah. We've learned a lot in the past couple of years. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Even like deeper on that, it's probably both. Like, yes, I am qualified, but they are also trying to fill a quota because at the same time, as black women, we have to work 10 times harder to get there. So, yeah. and that's what usually gets me. It's, it's not usually the like, am I qualified to be here? It's, I know I'm qualified to be here, but I also had to do the most. Oh, <laughs> just, just to get you to look, yeah, yeah to get you yeah. to look my way. And just like, for you really? to, just for me to have a seat at this table, I had to do already at the age of 20, more than most people I come across <laughs> yeah. so that I can get yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so that sucks. It sucks, but, but it is the system we're in. It is the system we're in. Love the industry, but... It needs to work. <laughs> <laughs> work. Have you had the same like experience with like your sound and like being put in a box? Like what Piper said. So I think we did come from very similar like small um, town. Small <laughs> town, both did musical theater that type of thing. Trying to, I mean, I've always known like the kind of music that I write and what I sound like. Um, I've just always. I struggled finding someone to tr like that I trusted enough to hone my sound and put that into because I know nothing about production. So I really I, for the that's why I didn't put out music for the longest time. I was like I can't give this to anyone yet. I I'm not I don't trust anyone to understand what's going on in my head. Like I know what I want it to sound like and I can't explain it yet with um like production type like lingo. So I was like okay we'll we'll just wait till the right person comes around and then I met Sebastian who like <laughs> before um. In this world came out we were on many zoom calls <laughs> um, lots of uh, emails and messages and everything and like I just knew like and he from the demo the first demo that he sent me I was like how did you do that because that's exactly what I wanted that's exactly how I need to this to come off and uh, I feel like that was and now he's still my producer now I still go to him for he's working on my EP right now so I don't think I had the same struggle but I agree <laughs> with you um, being put in put in the box with everything you want to do I, I want to say a bad word, but I can't. You just got to say, forget them. <laughs> forget them. Forget them. Forget them. Trying to put you in the box. Like, yeah. I, like you said, there's so many little elements here and there that make up a sound. So, like, how how, how genres even exist? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but um, I 100% agree that, yeah. especially being a black woman, they, they already try to tell you what you sound like. Yep. And it's like, that's not it though. <laughs> so, yes. Tell us about your song, In This World. What was the writing process like? How was it received? Okay, so I wrote In This World um, last summer in the height of the worst summer of my life, of everyone's life, truthfully. Um, I wrote it in my closet crying because <laughs> it was just a breaking point for me. It was at the point where I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't even escape it in my dreams without seeing another black person dead or like 
fighting for my life with the people I've known my whole life to see if I even mattered to them. So it was just, it was a matter of time before I just kind of broke and in this world is was the result of that. Um, I wrote it all in about two hours <laughs> and I was like, wow, <laughs> that's that. And from the minute I finished the last line, I was like, this has to be my first single. It just meant so much to me and I knew that I wanted it to come out on February 1st, the first day of Black History Month, just because it just set the tone for everything that I wanted to get out. It was my own release. It was the only way that I could describe everything that I had been feeling for my entire life and especially that upcoming year. And it was really, it was received very well. Um, I got a ton of a ton of support from family, friends, people I've never met before, um, which was amazing, very reassuring. Because I, there were a couple uh, moments where I was like, "Do I actually want to release this?" Um, I, I I knew I wanted to, but I was like, "Is this what I want to be the first thing people like hear from me?" Um, but at the end, I was like, "Of course I do." Like it's time to stop worrying about. Um, how white people are going to receive it truthfully um coming from a small town in texas it, that was my biggest worry but i was like who cares if it's for me it's not for them so. it really struck a chord with me when you said like the more confident you get the more that people look to you to kind of be a spokesperson uh -huh. <sighs> and like it seems like just such an impossible space to be in because your confidence correlates with how people look to you but then the more eyes are on you the more scrutinized you are yeah so does it like work like it de like defeats your confidence or like how has that been for you like as your confidence Ooh. grows let me tell you <laughs> <laughs> i I, uh, oh, I don't even know where to start with this because I was dealing with this this morning. Mm -hmm. um, I like right here on this couch and I won't lie, I was just crying yeah. because I was thinking about this exact thing. Um, since the release of Risk, I've had a lot of young black girls reach out to me on Instagram and on TikTok saying I've become their icon and stuff like that. And while that's nice, I don't know what to do with that information because I'm like, I was nobody to you two weeks ago. And now I'm suddenly being put on this pedestal and they're telling me they love my confidence and, and all of these things. In addition, in addition to being a black woman, I'm also plus sized. So when I get told that I'm, it's great that I'm so confident, that's a little bit of a back in the <laughs> <problem. laughs> yeah. yeah. And so I don't know what to do with that. And the more my audience grows, the more people are constantly watching me. Mm -hmm. And I have to be careful of what I say. I have to watch what I'm doing or like <clears throat> where I'm going. Like it, it just becomes like all eyes are on you suddenly. And I was nobody like a few months ago. Not that I'm this huge person now, but like <laughs> like the more my audience I grows, I <laughs> The more my audience grows, I have to pay attention to every single detail that I'm doing because, and, and I'm okay to do it because I didn't have that idol to look up to. And so I, I'm glad that somebody does, that these girls are saying like, oh, we love you, we love your music, and we love what you're doing for black women in the music industry. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great. I just have to like be super careful and I have to pay attention to everything. But at the same time, I know that the more confident I get in my music and my sound and as an artist, it could take one statement. It like cancel culture, huge. It works it could against take, people. It, yeah, too. it it works mainly. So, mainly. It's so against us. Ugh. It just could take one thing, one sentence to be flipped on me and suddenly it, it's just gone like everything that i've been working for for the last few months and you know that i'm gonna keep working towards it could just be gone because i'm confident in myself but i'm also you know that could be easily flipped on a black woman saying oh i'm a narcissist mm. <laughs> oh i love myself no, you're too too let me look at lizzo like mm. powerful yeah. black woman Everyone but so because she posts a few TikToks a day about how she loves herself, she's suddenly a narcissist. She's too into herself. She's, you know, propagating, gaining weight and, and stuff like that when, when she's a vegan yeah, <laughs> and yeah, she's incredibly healthy and she takes care of herself. But it's, people aren't looking at that. 
They look for something. Yeah, they're for looking them. for something to hate you for. And yeah. then when she talked about doing something healthy, they were like, how could you do this? Yeah, how could you do this? You're, like, <laughs> you're an icon. Yeah. You're supposed to be the about same people anyway. that were like looking up to her. Yeah. yeah. It's, no, it's, it's has a horrible cycle. Man. It yeah, is. Right turn. Any yeah. black artist, you could, like, there is something. Beyonce even. Oh, Beyonce's great, but she's, she's also overrated. She's That's overrated. what they love to say. Her, she's not doing Ugh. anything with her. Vo- I mean, she's a powerful voice. But people she's are always saying anything. she's not saying anything. Oh my gosh, she's not Does speaking she Making fun of her character. Why? Megan Thee Stallion. Why does she need to making be fun of her something? looks. Making fun of her height. Like it's. But she's so confident in herself. Like it could literally be anything. But as we grow as artists, we're also <clears> like just. Put on that pedestal to immediately be knocked down. Like we're bowling pins. <laughs> to bowling pins. That's yeah. literally <laughs> what it is. Oh my god. <laughs> like seriously, it is such a mess. It is such a mess. Because I don't know about you, but like, uh, it, it's crazy how like my entire life throughout like elementary, middle school, and high school. I always was, I was a different person, obviously, but I was someone who searched for opportunities to speak my voice, obviously. I, I went out for these leadership opportunities and I tried to change like the situation that I was in, but I was also very aware of everything that was pushing against me. Mm-hmm. So once I was in those positions, for the longest time, I was like, oh, finally, I'm gonna, once I get this, like, I can finally just rest and I can finally just be who I need to be without anyone just like doing this or saying this. And it just got worse. <laughs> like, it's just, it's crazy how, like, how different it is when you're in a position of power or like a leadership position. And so many haters have so much to say. So much to say, not about the work that you're doing, not about what you're doing for them or for anyone, but just about the, the things about your appearance, about how you, how you look, how you sound, every other thing that doesn't matter. Things that I thought I was confident about myself, I just picked up, picked up, picked up until it's gone. Yep. Like that was, that was my entire childhood. That was in all of high school. It's, it's insane how fast. How fast they are with it. Like coming up with, with this stuff. <laughs> I'm like, good God. Like, what do y'all have? Y'all have anything else to do? Like, no, you can don't. you let a girl live? Can you let a girl live? Because it's yeah. just a constant struggle. And that goes with the trying to navigate it um, question as well. It's literally impossible. There is no way, there's no right road to go down to where you won't have someone constantly telling you you're doing something wrong. Yep. Jesus, like, yeah. please, mind your business, mind your business. <laughs> oh. What are your dreams for your musical career? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> That's much better. Um, my biggest dream has always been to be an artist that other people, they hear what I'm saying or they hear my voice and that does something for them. Whether it makes them feel something, whether it helps them through something, it is something that they need to look to or they want to look to to just feel. And just because that's um, that's why I listen to music, that's why most people listen to music, and so many artists have been that have done that for me. There have literally been days where I need to listen to a specific artist to get out of bed. There have been more, or I need to listen to a specific song to even go to bed, to just go to sleep. So like, if I can do that for at least like one person <laughs> or like for people in general, that would be like my biggest, biggest dream. Obviously I wanna be selling out stadiums and touring and performing every single day of my life because it's what I love to do. But the bigger dream that like kind of goes with that is just for someone, some little black girl to be like, oh, thank you. <laughs> like you are saying what I needed to hear or what I want to say and I, you're saying it to a lot of people so I'm, I'm hoping that I can do that for someone. Yeah, I would say it's the same thing for me, is be the role model that I didn't have growing up. Um, make music that I love, make music that I'm happy with. Like, uh, I know that when we were younger, we were probably, we would see the things on the internet or in movies and stuff, you know, like the, the artist gets signed to the label and they try to change their image. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like yeah. Um, but make music that I'm happy with, maintain who I want to be as an artist, and then inspire the next generation of not only future artists, but songwriters. Like, at, at 
the end of the day, I'm a songwriter. I love singing, but at the end of the day, I am a lyricist mm -hmm. and inspire the next generation of writers that can use their voice um, to do really good things in the world. Um, and then also with what I'm pursuing at NYU, like with my music business track, I I would love to, in some sort of way, work in a capacity where I can help other women of color in the music industry and advocate for them. Mm -hmm. um, hoping for law school, but like, we'll see, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and, and, you know, advocate for them in the legal sense. And I think what was the turning point for me, although Britney Spears is not a woman of color, what's going <laughs> on with Britney? Yeah. Like, I, the whole case just like interests yeah. me and like mm -hmm. I never want to see that happen to any female artist in music industry and then again with um, when Megan Thee Stallion had a bunch of con oh. controversy about I think a year ago, two years ago, things like that. Um, I feel like women of color in the music industry often get cheated out of their contracts um, and you know nobody's really reading them <laughs> no one's telling them at the age of you know 19 20 and they're getting signed younger and younger and younger now yeah like, Flo millie's 19 yeah. like yeah. you know no one's really explaining to them you're signing <clears throat> away your life <laughs> for the you're next few years yeah, yeah for the next few years and so i want to be that person that um can help the next generation of singer songwriters artists and and developing their work and um maintaining their sound mm -hmm. who they are yes. yeah yeah for sure for sure and i also just love performing yes. like it is oh i miss it so much it is my favorite thing to do and like it's like so much and if i i really want to like be a huge advocate for the arts because it played such an integral part in my like childhood and growing up like that was the one escape that I had whenever mm -hmm. I could go and do a show or just perform with my sisters it was the one thing that made me happy no matter what no matter what was happening I was like oh, let me just go sing real quick <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really like no child should like be deprived of that no kid no school should say oh we don't have the money I'm like that's ridiculous yeah. because it's just as important as any other subject yeah. that I really want I want it to be a universal thing. It should be everywhere. It should be accessible everywhere. So that's yeah. another big thing for me. We need more money in schools for music. Yeah. We do. We do. We do. These kids are talented, man. Yep. So who are your biggest musical inspirations? Wow. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's obviously a long list for both of us. Yeah. Um, yeah. Number one has always been and will forever be Beyonce. It will forever be Beyonce. She's always been number one to me. Um, I've always loved her music. I've loved every her performance, her her skill. Her skill, aside from everything, is just unbelievable. And it was the day I saw her in concert where I knew that this was the only thing I could do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I saw her in her um, Lemonade World Tour. And on that day, I literally, it was like... A, a movie moment where you look around in the crowd and everyone is just bawling, crying. And it wasn't even a sad song. Everyone was just crying. I think it was Diva. Everyone was just <laughs> crying at her Gosh. raw talent. Like, everyone around me was moved. And that's where I knew, like, I can't do anything else in my life. I cannot do anything else than move people the way she's moving people. I could not believe the entire stadium sold out, of course, of course. In Houston, of course. Like, ah, oh, it's just she is such an amazing artist in person. Not like I've met her, but I have been such a diehard fan for my whole life. So obviously, Beyonce, everything she does is just wow. Um, Megan Thee Stallion, yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. Obviously, because she's doing what needs to be done. She's giving what she needs to give. Yeah. <laughs> like, truthfully, she's breaking the molds, and no one can tell her anything. No one can tell her anything because at the end of the day, she's getting Grammys, she's getting checks, and yeah. she's beautiful, and she's talented, and she knows that, which is just so important. Like, oh, Meg, thank God for Meg. <laughs> um, I'm gonna think. <laughs> I'm gonna think some more. You can. You can. Go okay. On. Okay. <laughs> um, it's truly a laundry list. Yeah. Yeah. Inspire me. Like. And for me, it's like two 
different groups. It's like the people that inspire my lyricism and then the people that inspire the, yeah. Yeah, the artistry. 100%. And, you know, Aretha, Whitney. Of course. Like, that's yeah, that's course. where it started for me, is, is them. And um, now, like, more, I mean, Adele. <laughs> yeah. Love Adele, um, even Sam Smith, like, artists like that. And then there's just been a lot of... Um, recent artists that have just been popping up that I really admire the way that they've um, gone about their craft and I it would literally take me hours to like go to go this. like there's yeah. just so many artists that I am obsessed with um lately I've been getting back into Stevie Wonder of course um, I was just listening to him the other like day. I've been like, on the road trip Unmatched. Unmatched. I'm getting way yeah. back into Stevie Wonder and like yeah, that lately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Truthfully>. <laughs> and like as I've been writing new music, like it's his elements are starting to pop up more. And mm -hmm. as I'm like in um, like music theory, when I was taking music theory classes and first in music theory four, we would learn about the different chords. And I actually wrote my final paper on the Stevie Wonder chord. Um, and and like using his interpretations of music and he also is notable genre blender like basically invented that yeah <laughs> and um you know i love jazz music and i love soul and funk and he's just combining all of these different elements that i'm in love with and it's really been inspiring me lately so yeah. um definitely mr wonder yeah that's that's funny how you said that like it's been inspiring in your music because same thing for me, but I've been listening to a lot of Lauryn Hill lately oh. and it's coming out my lyrics. I'm like, wait a minute, yeah. wait a, because that, the miseducation of Lauryn Hill is literally one of the best albums yeah. of all time. Like, that like is so, it's so yeah. important and I, it's crazy how like, it's just a cycle, man. I hear yeah. these people and I, and listen, I, and I, I listen, listen and you feel and then you write yeah. and that's how it goes. Um, Another artist that I love, I love their songwriting is Phoebe Bridgers. Um, I I could watch her all day. I I don't know what it is. Like she is just so raw, so incredibly raw in everything she does, and the music is like it's unbelievable the things she sings about, and it's inspiring. It really is because it's that is a true example of someone putting their life into their music, like her life, her experiences, what she's like feeling, it's all there. And I, I feel like I know her, <laughs> just from listening to her album, like, yeah. I don't even know you girl, but this is amazing. Yeah. Um, so she's been inspiring my songwriting a lot, just to be a lot more open and yeah. honest. Yeah. Jasmine Sullivan. Jasmine Sullivan! <gasps> yes! Oh like my god! Dogs. Yeah. Yes! I hear Jasmine oh in both our music. God. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't even know. She's no Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So sure. good. You're so good. Yeah. Yeah. You're so good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. The list could go on forever. Yeah, <laughs> but, 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 I'm going to go back to Meg Thee Stallion. Oh. Um, <laughs> like, um, do you guys, like, like, how do you guys feel about, like, how she's kind of opening up? the world of like female sexuality especially for like black women being open about all of that and just like being like here world like you're gonna listen mm -hmm. to you're gonna listen it's amazing because no one's ever done it before and for the longest time i feel like a lot of black women were scared like yeah of the, what they were gonna get for it because yeah. she got a lot of stuff for it yeah. <laughs> she got a lot of stuff for that grammy performance she got a lot of stuff for WAP, man yeah like it was there's she was the one to say, I don't care, though. Yeah. And, like, it's time for you to stop thinking that women aren't sexual beings. Like, it's time for you to stop thinking that I can't, like, talk about sex yeah. <laughs> and say what we're feeling, what we're going through, what we want. Yeah. And it's just so, like, all I want to do is just, yes! <laughs> no, like, I can't cuss. <laughs> and it's like, yes, girl, Yes! <laughs> Uh, it's just so important and she's doing so much work that everyone loves to discredit but it's so it is so great for like people like us to no, see like and is. younger artists younger black girls to see man like that's why I'm so obsessed with her because no matter what anybody says you cannot deny that woman her truth and she's gonna say it oh 
Here's wow. the thing for me with Megan. Uh, she's opened so many doors. And as I'm growing up and I'm having more experiences in love and life and everything, I'm realizing that it is my mom is not going to like this. And it's okay to be sexual because okay. here's the thing. Like, black women are sexualized, but we are not allowed to be sexual. Mm -hmm. And, and like what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, like it's, it, we were never made to feel that way. Yeah. Like, growing up, I literally never ever thought I was going to be like this super, super like confident, like, you know, bad bleep, um, <laughs> because like, oh I was made, I was, <laughs> I was made to feel cute, like I, I black, black girls are cute. And not um, only that, pretty, exotic, pretty, you, ex you Nubian, Nubian. Nubian. <laughs> you had to okay. like, and not only that, it was like you had to act a certain way so people even saw you as cute, cute or pretty. Yeah. Because if you were to stray from that, then you're yeah. just disgusting and yeah. ugly and gross. Exactly. So you had like, you, we didn't even think about being sexual or acting in a sexual way because we just knew it was going to be. Wasn't never an option. It wasn't an option. Right. And it would just be, it would just go horribly for us. Right. Like, we would already be seen as more unattractive than we were already seen. If yeah. that's even possible. Yeah. Like, oh my God. No, I didn't even, like, and I, I honestly, I still go through this now yeah. where I'm like, no one's going to be attracted to me. Ugh, me too. Because I'm black. Like, Ugh. like I'm not anybody's first choice. Like, I genuinely have thought that. I've said those words to myself. Me this week. I, that's just how I've been conditioned. Like, growing up and in, in high school, I was not the option. My friends, my, my white girlfriends, they always, were the option. Always heard about their relationship. Yeah, I always heard what they were up to. And I I just wasn't a choice for anybody. Yeah. Yeah. That, it wasn't the desired choice. Like, no. And that's, it was so scary even having a crush on anyone. I was like, I'm yeah. this to myself. I'm like, Jessica, why don't you just go tell them? Honey, it's not going to end it's up not that way. Easy. It's not that easy. Yeah, it's because you just don't know. Like, it's I, just not going to happen that way. It'll never be that way no like and that's why you're sometimes just gonna lock it but <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's horrible it's, it's horrible so it's not the right thing to do truthfully but it's just what happens when you're conditioned in that way and yeah. it's to this day i question every romantic every, endeavor everything. i'm like do you really like me or is this a fetish no do i you really, really like that. that do you or really like really a fetish oh, yeah like yeah. it's so it is it's tough. horrible and I wish I could say that, like, the alternative, like, oh, it's okay, our black man got us. <laughs> <laughs> Usually they are the worst. They don't got us. They don't got us. We, yeah. Only we got us. So oh it's God. like, what? Oh, my God. Like, yes, I am a strong black woman, but not because of you. Not because yeah. you tell me I am. I, I have no other choice. I have no you. choice. Oh, my God. I wouldn't I be here today to. if I didn't, like, do what I had to do. Right. I have to be a strong black woman because what other choice is there? There is, you can't but, live. <laughs> but also, like, Mae the Stallion has been, she's kind of been creating that space, like, we don't have to be that strong black women, woman 24 7. We can, you know, we deserve pleasure and happiness and romance and to be a hot girl. Like, we deserve that. We can take a day off. We can take, we can a, couple take, a, day we can take off. a couple hours off to, you know, just do what everybody else gets to do on the daily basis. On the daily. We're working like, so hard 24-7. We can take a breather. Yeah. It's, I mean, you see my two laptops over there. <laughs> <laughs> the sticky notes on the wall. My <laughs> sticky notes on the wall. Like, that's what I'm doing 24-7 is working towards the next goal. And sometimes I forget, like, I need to step back or I can just yeah. be sad or man. Retweet. <laughs> Workaholics. Yeah, Truth workaholics. It's the only way we know. It's yeah. the only way we know. Yep. Piper. Yeah. Tell us about your song, Riss. I don't wanna. <laughs> How did you write it? How was it received? Okay. Um, so, Riss. Who was a long process. <laughs> it was a really long process. Um, very different from just this two hour song writing session. I mean, yeah. sometimes that happens. Sometimes yeah. I can write a song in two hours, but no, Risk took a really long time. And I said this in inter interviews before like, Risk 
I wrote it. I don't remember writing it. I think I just like was watching a movie or something and I took the plot and I was like, I'm gonna write a song about this. And I do it a lot. Like I, I don't even remember it. It was just something that existed. And then like a year later when I was going through my hookbook, I'm trying to decide my hookbook, like what song do I want to work on today? And that was just the, the song. I usually like when I sit down on the piano, I'll play a song from memory. And if I do that more than like three times, and it's the same song all three times, that's probably the song I'm going to finish or the song that I want to work on. And for like a week, it was just wrist that I was playing and I was like, oh, maybe I should finish this. And it was kind of coincidental that I was also going through a very similar situation in my real life that risk is about, like that hesitancy to be vulnerable in a relationship and the beginnings of something and not sure if you fully want to commit and like things like that. And so it was a coincidence that I was going through it, but the best coincidence possible, possible because I ended up finishing the song in that one session. And I think that's when I wrote the second half of it. Um, and then it wasn't meant to like be my first single after two years at all. Like I sent it to our friend Will, who's in our program, and we had worked together before, like on a couple covers and stuff. And I was like, hey, do you want to work on this song with me? And I sent it to him. He was, I think, my only friend in New York at the time um, who I, that did music. So I sent it to him. He started working on it. And then a few months went by. Just, you know, we got busy. <laughs> I tracked the vocals at his place. And um, again, they were just supposed to be demo vocals. They were not ever supposed to see the light of day. <laughs> and um, I think around... February, I was like, let's pick this back up. Let's finish the song. It was just supposed to be a list on a list of demos that I was going to um, send to producers that I had been working at in a recording studio. Um, yeah, it meant nothing. And then February came around and the song ended up being really good. The demo just sounded really good. So I was like, okay, I guess I should finish this. But you know, with COVID and everything going on, a lot of the studios were closed. And so I never got in anywhere to track vocals. So the original vocals are the, in the current song. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You sound fire. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and eventually Will passed it off to another producer, Jesse Blue, who also goes to NYU. And they were friends. We had a bunch of mutual friends. Jesse is the one who finished the song. Um, absolutely knocked it out of the park. Like, Fire. he got, he had every single mark. I sent him, when I work with any producer, I send them like my Spotify playlist of like, reference. my reference yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And someone, some, I think it was a mentor or something told me like, when you're working on a song or like an album or something, like combine all the songs that you love and put them in the order. Like if you had to create an EP, put them in that order. Um, that you would develop your EP. So I sent him all of these reference tracks from so many different artists. And I'm like, because I'm similar to you, I can't hear like the production. I can't, I can't no. hear the production. No, so mind. I sent Jesse and Will this Spotify for this. I'm like, do, do this. this <laughs> that, what you will. Um, <laughs> I want it to be fun. I want it to be upbeat. I want people to be able to dance to it. But I also want it to be like sensual and, you know, mean something and horns and. <laughs> all these things like do with that information what you will and after like drop six it was perfect um and recorded the backing vocals in my bedroom um <laughs> on my phone um and sent them in and we finished that up and then after that it was really just kind of like oh like, crap we've got a song like i guess i should put it out like is that the next step is that the is that what people do like i guess they put it out right and um, I was just kind of starting my relationship with my manager, who's like one of my best friends, but um, now my manager and talking to her like, hey, I think maybe we need some other people to help out with this because I, I can do it myself, but like I shouldn't have to. Um, I'm a college student and I'm also an intern and I'm also, you know, doing this music thing and I'm also a co-founder. Like I got a lot going on and I can't, I don't really have the time to be sitting at my desk every hour of the day sending emails to, to PR agencies and, and like things like this and to promote the music. I need help. 
Um, and so that's when we put together um, an artist team, which is I have two publicists, I have two managers, um, one publisher, uh, one on the marketing team, and one creative director. Um, all women, and they're phenomenal, and they've been killing it ever since. And um, so it, it's been received quite well. <laughs> and I that's wish right. I could, I that's right. yeah, yeah. I wish I could say it was like luck, but no, absolutely, no. we've been working it's at important. it, yeah. like, drilling it. Like um, there, I, in my opinion, there just shouldn't be a single soul that hasn't heard the song. And that's, right, that's the way it should be. Like, li like I'll link it in the. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we've been absolutely pushing it and uh, it was just so well received and then we did the music video and that was also uh, well received. We're still pushing that with different platforms. Um, I was on a magazine cover, like I, mm -hmm. if you had told me this last yeah. year that Truthfully, that was going to yeah. happen and I'd be in the place that I'm in and no, I simply would have laughed in your face. Like <laughs> I did not think at all this would happen and, and TikTok has honestly been a huge part of that because mm -hmm. um, the song blew up on TikTok twice and so that was the, the momentum came from that I think a lot at the beginning yeah it's been a long road, it's <laughs> long road. how have your life experiences influenced your artistic persona Mm -hmm. okay um a lot of a lot of it came from that thing I said earlier about um, that artist manager said like I didn't have a sound. Mm -hmm. So that that's really where it kicked in the high dive for me. I was like, oh, he's, he's like right. Um, because my first project, Pipe Page the EP, was um, I made it in high school. I was still very, hmm, I was doing two things. I was a very singer-songwriter because I still now don't have any content production at all. <laughs> um, it was just me and my piano. And that's all I knew how to do. I didn't know how to do anything outside of that. I think one of the songs had like one additional thing, like other than piano. <laughs> so they were very acoustic and that's not me. Um, and the second thing was like, I was very much trying to be what I thought people wanted to hear um, because I am from the Midwest and like it's country, folk, singer, songwriter, acoustic, that is the vibe. And so I thought I had to do that in order to get people to listen to my music. And um, one, that's not true. And two, they didn't listen to it anyway. <laughs> so partially my fault because I did know how to market myself when I was 17. But I, as I've grown and like moving to New York was the best decision of my life. Like the best decision because I've been able to grow and find my sound and like learn who I am as a person first and then draw draw on those experiences that I've had um, in life and in love and in, in the friendships that I've had in the last couple of years and just everything. So it has a lot to do with growing up and I would hope that my sound, no, I know that my sound is growing with me. Like Risk is drastically different than any song on my EP. Um, lyrically not, not that different because I think my writing style is mostly stay the same. It's still like me at the core, but the sound drastically different. Um, and yeah, I think I answered your question. <laughs> you did. Great. You did. <laughs> okay, for me, ooh, that's a really good question because I've always been a very self-aware person. Like I am very like in tune with myself. Um, uh, even though, like, I'll literally be like, oh, don't like that I did that, oh well. Ooh, like, I, I'm very, like, I know who I am. I have always been yeah. that type of person. And a lot of people have told me that they something that's something that they see on me, and I kind of wear it on my sleeve, which is like, I take it as a compliment, because I, I, I guess something I, I do. <laughs> but um, I've always loved singing. I've always loved, I've, I hadn't put out any music up until this past year, because all I did was write. Um, and then plunk stuff out on the piano. Yeah. Um, my sisters were a really big influence on um, my music because they did it first. <laughs> they sang all the time. We sang together in church. Um, we did musical theater community shows together. And that, that just made me fall in love with performing. It made me fall in love with greeting people after shows and them telling me like what that performance did for them. And it, it just did a lot for me. 
and as I grew and I saw like a lot of my friends who were independent artists as well in high school and I saw them putting out music and be like, Jessica, when's it coming from you? I'm like, hold on, <laughs> you're not gonna get it yet. Not gonna get it in the next four years, I promise you. Just because I, I don't know, I'm a very like specific person and I, I like the way, like I like getting things done a certain way. So for the longest time I was like, I'm gonna keep my little song book and I'm gonna keep writing about what I'm experiencing. And I don't know, maybe I'll record some of it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and that day came within this world, and like I said, I, I knew it had to be number one. And it's actually kind of funny because the hardest thing for me to choose was my um, stage name. I have yeah, been going, I, <laughs> I have been trying to find a name that encompasses me as an artist since my freshman year in high school. I asked all my friends, I asked my choir director, I asked like teachers, I asked anyone who would listen. I'm not gonna go by Jessica. There are so many Jessicas. <laughs> I'm not gonna go by Omokiki. <laughs> that is just too long, too hard to pronounce. People are not gonna wanna do that. Uh, but still, always correct them on your name. Always correct them on how to say your name. Do it. Um, didn't wanna do Kiki because, I don't know, it just didn't really fit for me. And my middle name is Bisola, which actually means born into wealth in Yoruba, Nigerian language. And so Sola literally means wealth. And I was like, that's right. <laughs> mean like money I mean like the richness of who I am like there's just so much there are so many layers there's so much to who I am and I true I truly am in love with who I am and I that's there I'm wealthy in that I'm like in that love there's and it took me a long time to be even comfortable saying that just because like the insecurity is and everything we've gone through yeah. and like it's something I'm like a year ago I, I I wouldn't be able to tell you that I could have gone by that name, but like, it's just, it's just so right. It fits yeah. so well, and it's what I knew that I could release music under, and I wanted people to look at me and say, that's Sola. Yeah. And that's what I did. How has music helped you find liberation in your blackness? Amazing question. Um, for me, for the longest time, I just thought I was alone. <laughs> That's the biggest thing that black artists and black women have done in music, have done for me, have given me a companion growing up. Like, even with two older sisters, they're closer in age than I was, so a lot of the stuff that I was going through, I either didn't feel comfortable talking to them about it because they were like besties and I was just over there. <laughs> um, or I just thought, oh, they had so many friends, I was like, they're probably not even going through that, you know? So, especially when we were doing musical theater, they like were really popular and did all like a lot of stuff with their friends, and I was just too young to hang out with them. So I just, everything that I was feeling, everything that I was experiencing, I had no one to talk to about it. But hearing, hearing the music that I grew up with and hearing the music that I hear today just constantly validates what I'm feeling and it reminds me that I'm not alone, which is so, it's so important. It is so important, I can't stress that enough because without that, there's no way to yeah. be like alive. <laughs> like seriously, without yeah. that, like for the longest time, you just, you think so many things and so many experiences and then you you watch an interview with any black woman in music and you're like wow mm -hmm. so we're twins so we live the same life yeah. and it just confirms that you're not crazy like they make you out to be because that's what they love to do they love to villainize you and gaslight you and make you think that what you're feeling isn't like valid and it's not true but what you feel is what you feel there's no there's no yes or no that's right or wrong it's the truth so like that's the biggest thing it's done for me. It's helped me to see that I am valid. I what I am saying is true and it needs to be heard. It, it has it's has value, which yeah. is oh there's nothing there's nothing that beats that. There's nothing else that can give me that. Yeah. Similar for me. Um I am the youngest in my family and there's only two of me, two of us, two of me. Two of us. My sister is 12 years older than me. Um and so like my parents are a little bit older, so I kind of always grew up with, um, like I just had to be mature. Like I always had to be on point, and, and it's not something that my parents like made me do, it's just something I adapted. Because I was constantly a, around an older group of people, like in, with my sister and her friends, like I was just naturally 
more mature um and but because i was so young to be that mature is kind of like it's way too, too much. much of a burden to bear it's way too much of a burden to bear and so like again like i i did feel alone because i didn't feel on the same level as my friends at my age and like even now people will say to me like with the exception of like you guys and the people in my program like people are like all oh, your friends are so much older than you because my friends are like mm -hmm. we're seniors when i was a sophomore or even in high school my friends were seniors in high school or going into college i was a freshman mm -hmm. it's just always been that way because i have had to grow up so fast um and it really sucked and then especially like my freshman year of college was a very difficult time for me mm -hmm. and that also just catapulted me <laughs> so i had to grow up again um moving across the country and now and then like living alone and now i, I live alone <laughs> in a big city and, and now in brooklyn and just so much has happened over the last two years that i've had to really grow up um and it's been great but it's really lonely um and music has been the, the thing that got me through it and before i started therapy in high school music was my therapy it was yeah. the only way like you said that we, yeah really like don't it, worry i'm working on it <laughs> it really was the only thing that made me feel valid in my feelings and um what i think i want to say it was like sophomore or maybe junior year of high school I listened to one song it was Colombia by local natives um every day multiple times a day and if you listen to that song I think you'll like understand why it's just a very like grounding song um and honestly I still listen to it like pretty much every day <laughs> because it's like who are you where do you want to go you know it it was a very grounding song for me and then when I started like really songwriting and really getting into music and into my music career, again, like that was my therapy. It was the only way that I could fathom anything I was feeling, these thoughts, these intrusive thoughts, these uh, bad relationships I was having with my friends and, and when I would fight with my family um, and not understand, you know, what it is what, that I was doing wrong because in my mind, I was doing everything right. I was, you know, I grew up so fast that I was like, I'm the, I'm the perfect kid. Like, what, so when my parents yell at me or when I get into a fight with a friend or, or something like that, how am I, how is it that I'm doing something wrong? Because in my mind, I was doing everything right, trying to be the best version of myself that I could be. But it, by doing that, I was also in the worst state possible. I was not my best self at all. Um, but music has been so liberating over the last few years because now I'm the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. Now I understand where I went wrong and, and what I, who I was relying on, why I was so reliant on them. And, you know, I've got me, I've got, I've got me and I don't think I, I didn't have me. I like, mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't have my own back yeah. growing up. I just did it. Um, so it's definitely been very necessary for me to be the person that I am today and the artist that I am today. Made us who we are. It did. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is the end of the interview. <laughs> okay. I just want to say a big thank you to you guys for doing thank this. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> me too. <laughs> songs yes. in this row by Sola, Risk by Piper Page. Yes. It's Sola official Piper, Piper Page. Page. Classic, classic, <laughs> yeah. man. Yeah. Instagram, TikTok, One day I'll get you it. name it. Yeah. I'll follow them. All right. Try, baby. <laughs>